So, to recap, I'm Andy. I work for the NCC Group in the UK. Um, about 20% of our business is web performance, so retailers, financial services, that sort of thing. Um, I was really interested in Speedy when it first came out. I've since, as the protocol, as the protocol has moved on, um, I've got increasingly interested in HTTP2. And what I'm going to spend the next ooh, 40 minutes we have now, we might run into the break, um, talking about is what's HTTP2? Why do we need it? What does it mean for our customers and our websites? Um, but first of all, the ine inevitable book plug, as Peter said, part one before our interlude. Um, I wrote using web page tests with uh, Rick Viscomi and Marcel Duran of YouTube. And a couple of years ago, I wrote uh, the pocket guide to web performance um, for five simple steps. Um, go buy them. That's my plug over. Um, but if we're going to talk about HTTP2, first of all, we need to take a step back in time. And where we need to take a step back in time to is 1999, when Google was one year old. If you're old enough to have been working in technology then, you were probably working on one or two things. You were probably part of the panic to fix all the dates in all our mainframe applications before Millennium Bug came along and broke everything. Or you were part of the dot-com boom, and you were one of those early poster childs working on the web, exploring this new frontier, probably over your AOL dial-up connection. But the other thing that happened in 1999 is RFC 2616 was standardized. So HTTP 1.1 was standardized. It wasn't the first time it was standardized. It was originally standardized in uh, 1997, but we finally settled on a version that lived for the next 15 years in 1999. And the web of 1999 isn't the web of today. Um, this is Yahoo that I pulled from the HTTP archive. And as we can see, it's very different to modern websites. It's mainly text. There's a few images for Visa, the ad banner, um, no CSS support, um, fonts were used done using the inline font tag. And the web has changed tremendously since 1999. Yahoo still looks roughly the same. We can recognize it as Yahoo. Apart from it has more images, it has uh, richer typography, it's a more sophisticated layout. And if you look at the HTTP archive, you can see that our websites have got increasingly more sophisticated, more resources on them, more scripts, CSS, more content coming from other places. But we don't just have documents. We've moved on to a web that has a rich level of interactivity. We have spreadsheets, word processors, um, real-time things like the Facebook feed or Twitter, where we're trying to do much more with the web, much more over HTTP. And that poses some challenges for us. Because TCP, which is the fundamental building block that HTTP runs over. HTTP can run over other things. There is a standard for running it over um, ham radio, for example. Um, but the reality is most of our HTTP happens over TCP. And there's a bit of a mismatch between what TCP is good at and what HTTP requires. So TCP was built for reliable delivery of large files over long distances. And the web's not made up of that. Our files may come over long distances, but the web is made up of lots and lots of small components. So we don't use, HTTP doesn't use TCP as efficient as it could. And what we've been doing is we've been hacking around some of these limitations, perhaps not realizing the implications of the hacks we're making. For starters, we have this thing where each TCP connection can only support one HTTP request at a time. Until that request is finished, that TCP connection doesn't become available again. If that connection is slow, sorry, if that request or response is slow, then that connection is tied up for that time and can't be used for anything else. So we hacked our way around it. 
what we did is in the initial spec, browsers were only allowed to make use two TCP connections to make two requests in parallel. And then Firefox discovered that if they upped that limit, pages loaded faster. So we went from browsers that could only make two parallel connections to ones that could make four or six or eight. And IE 11, under some circumstances, makes something like 11 or 12 or 13. I can never quite remember. But that wasn't good enough for us. So what we started doing is splitting our requests across, across more domains. So this is the BBC um, from a few years back. And they split their content across four domains. So instead of, if we've got a browser that can make a maximum of, say, six connections in parallel, all of a sudden, we've got 24 connections in parallel that we can be busily downloading things over to try and make efficient usage of the network. But when we do this, we override some of TCP's mechanisms. We override its congestion control mechanism that it uses to determine what's the um, optimum amount of packets it can send down or send across the network. And we run the risk of congestion, of things like our router buffers filling up, so dropping packets. Um, and we run into the risk of packet loss. So sharding multiple TCP connections delivers benefits to a point in time, but then it gives us danger. We can run in situations where it actually makes our performance worse. And Will Chan, who was of the Chromium team at the, um, in the past, wrote a blog post talking about how Etsy sharded across four domains and how they were running into packet loss situations so that actually they were sharding across too many domains and it made their performance worse. So not only do we do these things to override some of the, um, the mismatch between um, HTTP and TCP, every HTTP request comes with an overhead. Um, the most fundamental overhead is the overhead of latency, where how quickly we can send a request to somewhere and get a response back is governed by the speed of light. Network packets travel at roughly two-thirds of the speed of light down a piece of fiber optic. And that means it also matters how far away from us our servers are, because the further they are away, the longer our pages will take to load, the longer our packets will take to come back to us. And Mike Belshi did a study called More Bandwidth Doesn't Matter Much, where he looked at the relationship between latency and bandwidth and what implications they had for how quickly our pages load. And as we can see here, quite clearly, there's a linear relationship. As latency goes up, our page load times get longer. Um, there's another aspect in that with every HTTP request, we send our headers. And our headers often contain lots of repeated information, like the user agent string will be the same for every request made on a web page. Um, and although we can do things like gzip the content that we send over the wire, so gzip the HTML or the CSS or the JavaScript, that only affects the body of the content we're sending. The headers remain uncompressed with all their duplicate information. And then the other thing we do is um, TCP, as part of its congestion control mechanism, has something called the congestion window. And what that is, is it's um, how many packets a server is allowed to send to the client without waiting for a response. So what happens um, is typically a server set up with an initial congestion window of 10. So that means when it gets a request, it can ten send 10 segments in return. Um, if those are acknowledged, then the congestion window grows. So the number of packets it can send next time um, increases. If there's packet loss, it decreases. But what that means is if at any point we have small files that don't fill the congestion window, then we're wasting the bandwidth. We're wasting the opportunity to send more packets. In this case, we've got a response that's uh, three segments, and we could have sent seven segments more. So we've sent somewhere around 4.5K. We could have sent 14.5. So to overcome this, we follow recipes. We follow some of the recipes that um, Barbara mentioned earlier on that Steve Souders came up with. 
And we follow these recipes without always being aware of what that means or what the implications are. And one of the recipes we follow is to bundle small CSS files together or bundle small JavaScript files together to make them more efficient to download. So they fill the congestion window so we get rid of the overhead of the, the latency and the request and the response. So we get rid of the duplication in the headers. But that comes with implications. We give the browser more to download, whether it needs it or not. And if we change just one part of that bundle, it becomes invalid. The browser can't use it anymore. It has to download it again, or a proxy cache has to download it again. We do a similar thing with images. So we take all our small images and build them into sprites, because lots of our small icon images are only a couple K. So we build sprite sheets. But then to get just one image, we have to decode the whole sprite sheet. And what that means is the browser will cache the whole sprite sheet in, um, on disk, or disk even on a phone. But every time it wants an image out of there, it may have to decode the whole sprite sheet. You know, it, it will keep it in a, in a memory cache. But if that memory cache, if memory gets tight in that cache, it may have to kick it out. And then if it comes to needing it again, it will have to decode it again. The other thing we do is we override the browser's priorities. So all modern browsers use a heuristics to determine what order they should download things off the web. Um, most of them will prioritize CSS, where the media query matches, um, then generally JavaScript. If you look at a waterfall these days, you'll often see that even if you put your JavaScript at the bottom of the page, the browser's requested it quite early in the waterfall because it's determined it's a critical resource. Um, so the browsers make these choices for us based on the massive amount of pages they see. Um, they use telemetry to send it back to make decisions on what's the optimal way to load a page. But every time we do things like embed some um, binary data using a data URI in a CSS, we're overriding those priorities. I'm looking at a client now where they have something like 34 images embedded in their CSS um, as data URIs. And what that means is that CSS is bigger. Um, when it comes to rendering the page, it means the CSS will take longer to download. So the, brow the visitor will have to wait longer for that page to start to render. Whereas if these were normal images, the browser would make a decision on when it should use them based on its own heuristics. The other thing we do is we inline critical resources. Like um, this is a bit I stole from a guy named Yoav Weiss's blog. Um, he implemented the picture element in Chrome. So we all owe him a big favor. But we do things like take the CSS, work out what's critical, work out what we really need to render our page, and embed it in the head, which gives us some maintenance problems going on. And what all these techniques we use to speed up our pages show is that there's a tension between development and delivery. As developers, we think of code, code in modules. We modularize our code so our, co our components have a single um, responsibility. So we can transport them and use them in other situations. So we can encapsulate behavior in them so people only have to worry about their external interface. But that's not always the most efficient way to put it over the network. Or it's not the most efficient way to put it over the network. To put it over the network, we need to do, we need to do things like combine them together um, and play around perhaps overriding the browser's heuristics. And what we've been doing so far is using things like uh, mod page speed, task runners like Gulp and Grunt, Broccoli, Plumber, however long the list goes on, um, to try and fill this mismatch, to try and make it easier to develop in a way that's efficient for us as developers, but then turn it into something that's effect, uh, efficient to deliver over the network. But what if we could use the network more efficiently? What if our network protocol supported us better in maintaining this granularity in production and enabled us to deliver efficiently over the network. And that's where HTTP2 
comes in. And in common with everybody who stands on stage and talks about HP2, they show a video. And they show a video of HP 1.1 versus HP2. Um, this is the Go for Tiles demo. If you started playing. Um, and as you can quite see, clearly see, the HP2 version is faster. Akamai have their own version of this demo. Um, CDN77 built their other own, and I'm sure there are others. But it's an impressive test, because this was done in 1.3 seconds, and this was done in 3.6. But the question I'd ask you, and the question I'd encourage you to ask of anybody who shows you a demo where he says this is faster than that, or she says this is faster than that, is it's impressive, but does it represent the real world? Um, that image is made up of lots and lots of small images. We know in the HP 1.1 world, we can only make a limited number of requests at a time. So, and we know that making requests for small, Im small resources is particularly inefficient. So what we've got here is a test that actually we know is really inefficient for HP 1.1. Um, and so HP 2 be beats it. It's not a great test in my view, but we'll come on to some other tests in a minute and some real world experience. But whenever somebody puts one of these in front of you, ask them, ask them to explain why it's a good test. So HB2 itself, if you remember nothing else from this talk, remember the top bullet point that from a web developer's point of view, from an application developer's point of view, um, the HTTP methods remain the same. So we still got get, post, put, delete, head, etc. The status codes are the same. So 200 is still a success. 404 is um, not found. 500s are something is wrong with my server. And the whole semantics of how the protocol works remain the same. But underneath, things begin to change. So we've moved from a, it moves from a protocol where there were text-based headers in HTTP 1.1 to having binary headers. We can compress headers so that all that overhead of those headers starts to diminish. It's multiplexed, which I'll come on into in a minute. And also, instead of having the current HTTP 1.1 model, where it's always a pull model, where the browser asks the server for the web page, parses the HTML, sees, oh, I need this CSS file, asks the server for the CSS file, and the browser is always pulling from the server the server can actually begin to say to the browser, you've requested this HTML file. You need this CSS file as well before the browser becomes aware of it. So waterfall from web page test. Um, this is a HTTP2 waterfall um, for the test page I use for this. And it, it looks pretty much like a HTTP 1.1 waterfall. The thing you'll notice is with HTTP 1.1, you'd expect far more of a, a slope like this, whereas we seem to have blocks where the browser sent a chunk of requests to the server and get some responses back. But in HTTP 2 or H2, every request to the same origin becomes a stream. And streams are divided into frames. Um, and in this example, there's a header frame, so the headers go separately in their own frame. And there's some data frames that essentially contain the response body for this request. There are also frames to reset a stream, um, push content, and, and various other ones. And because we're only using a single TCP connection, those frames are then multiplexed over that connection. So in this example here, the headers for stream one have already gone. But then we've got some data for stream one. And then we've got the headers for stream two and some data for stream two. And then we've got some more data for stream one. So what we get is all these frames are multiplexed and intermingled across a single TCP connection. And this is what it looks like. If you ever looked at the bottom of web page test below the waterfall, you'll see there's a TCP connection diagram. Um, and this is the same site loaded. Uh, top one is HTTP2, so we see a single TCP connection, bottom one is HTTP 1.1, where we can see, in this case, 
There's six TCP connections. So if we're going to multiplex and mix these frames over a single connection, how do we know we're going to download the right frames first? How do we determine what our priorities are? And H2 has a prioritization mechanism that depends on weights and dependencies. Um, and not everybody implements this yet. So Chrome, for example, implements the weights, but doesn't implement the dependencies yet. So what we have in this situation is we have the, the root object right at the top. And we have three objects, so two, four, and six, that depend on it. And those are the three streams that get priority in the beginning, or right now. And the way they're split up is with a weight of 200, um, effectively, stream two gets two thirds of the band of, of the frames. Stream one, uh, stream four gets a third, and stream six, that's at really low priority, effectively gets nothing. It will only get some time on the wire if the other streams become blocked for some reason. And then what happens is if um, stream two completes, then eight and ten will share its frames or share its allowance between them. So this allows us to build up quite complex models of how um, the server sends us content. And the other thing to mention about uh, the weights and dependencies is that the browser hints them to the server or expresses a preference, but the server is free to override those based on what knowledge it's already got. And there's some real challenges around this about what is the optimal order, what is the optimal priority, and just because we start out with those, does it remain that way? So we request the web page. Um, first thing we're going to get is the HTML file. Does the frames for the HTML remain our priority for the whole point it's downloaded? Or at some point when we've got past the head and we need start to need the CSS or any JavaScript that's in the head to start to render the document, do they become more important? And there are all sorts of questions like this out there waiting to be explored. Um, we get header compression using HPAC, um, which helps just reduce simple duplication. And there are plenty of um, illustrations. So Ilya Grigoric's got some great stuff in one of his talks about H2, where he shows the header compression in a bit more detail. I chose not to do it here. So question is, does it make any difference? Um, and so what I did is I took a template I found on a template site. Um, it's not quite, a, a, it's probably not the best model of a modern web page because it's only got about 30, 40 requests on it, whereas we know modern web pages are a bit more complex than that. I hosted it on AWS in Dublin and I tested it from AWS in Singapore using web page test and its cable profile. And if we hit play, Been to see that the, the HP21 starts to, to get there sooner. HP1.1 catches up. Then much better. And it stay, this begins to finish now. And this goes on till I think about 13 seconds. But if you remember, I said to you if anybody ever shows you a comparison side by side where one thing is faster than the other, you should question them. So you might say to me, Andy, I might host in Dublin, but my customers aren't in Singapore. My customers are on mainland Britain. Or I might host in Stockholm, and my customers are in, in mainland Sweden. So give me a more realistic case. And what I choose to do is do the same test with both the host and the test agent in Dublin. So they were really, really close together. And what we can see is HTTP 1.1 gets there a bit quicker in the beginning. Not surprising, really, because HTTP 2 has had to make um, a secure connection. It's had to do a TLS negotiation. So it's had a bit of more overhead to begin with. Then, as we start to scroll on, we well, can see HTTP 2 sort of gets ahead. But you know they, they go in about 
at the same time. But the advantage we've got is we've got a secure connection. We've managed to use H2 to overcome the overhead of the secure connection. But that's, those are my tests. Some real-world numbers um, from the FT that a guy from Google talked about at Chrome Dev Summit is the FT are experimenting with HTTP2 on their next FT platform. Um, and they've got a bit of a strange setup in that they serve their origin from Fastly, um, which isn't H2 capable. Um, but they serve all their images and some other resources from Akamai. So based on month data, we can see that you know, those people who are H2 enabled and using it are getting a faster experience. So we're beginning to see that in the real world, H2 delivers some of the promises. And this is just where they're using it as a straight like-for-like -like replacement of HTTP 1. They're not using any of the new features that we can use. Or, sorry, they're not using some of the new optimizations that are open to them. And HTTP 2 gives us some new optimizations and some new tools we can play with. And the first of those is, is server push, um, where what normally happens when we request a, a page from a server is we do a GET request for our root page and some PHP or some Java or something else goes away and starts building that page. And then when that page is built, to get returned to the client, the browser starts to parse it, discovers it needs some more resources, and starts requesting them. But quite often, we'll know what resources go with that page. Our server sees people request that page thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of times, perhaps. So it can begin to learn. When I request page X, I need to send Y CSS with it. And um, Jetty has some of this built in at the moment. But what it means we can do is we can start to send the browser the critical resources. So the things it needs to render the page, like CSS or blocking JavaScript, before we've actually finished, build the page and send the page back to them. Um, so then, once we've sent the CSS, the, the page starts to come back in its own time. There are some challenges in that the browser can reject the push. Um, say if it's got it already got it in its cache, it can reset, issue a stream reset, say it doesn't want this. The, the challenge may be is the bytes may already be on the wire and um, being downloaded anyway. Um, H2O, which is one of the um, HTTP2 servers developed in Japan, um, has this um, concept of something called Casper, which is cache-aware server push. So it uses cookies to try and determine what you'd already have in your cache to decide whether to push it or not. Um, so there are people thinking about this problem, but how can we use push intelligently? So that we don't, so we only put the critical bytes on the wire. There are, there are other opportunities, <coughs> excuse me, for server push. So Barbara showed this diagram this morning about um, the critical rendering path for a browser, where we have to take the HTML and build a DOM from it. We have to take CSS and build the CSS object model from it, and then JavaScript may interact, and then we we get to build the render tree. And it's only when we build the render tree, when we understand what styles are being applied to what elements on the page, that we begin to understand what background images are needed or what fonts are needed. And fonts are important because most browsers, or all modern browsers with the exception of IE, will wait for the font before they render the text on the page. So we'll wait for a web font before they render the text on the page. So if we can host the font ourselves or use an intelligent font foundry, then that has the option to push that font to us before we've discovered we need it. Multiplexing itself offers some other really interesting possibilities. Um, and John Meller of Google did a, a study a few years ago where he compared um, parallel downloading as in Speedy at the time versus HTTP 1.1 as it behaved to determine how much of an image in terms of bytes do we actually need to download to make a page usable. Um, knowing that in a world of H2 or Speedy, we don't have to download a whole image. We get it 
chunk by chunk. Whereas in a HTTP 1.1 world, we have no choice but to download the whole image because we're occupying that TCP connection. So um, this is essentially the simile for HTTP 1.1, and this is HTTP 2. And we can see already just with 5% of the bytes of each image downloaded that yeah, this page is looking like it's going to become more usable. Um, when we get to 15% of the bytes, yeah, this looks largely complete. I can assure you it's not. I can assure you Mark Zuckerberg's a bit pixelated, and the man walking in the snow is, is a bit pixelated. We've got a really, really usable page. By the time we get to 25% of the image bytes, these images are pretty crisp, pretty clear, pretty usable. It looks complete to our user. And actually, the sequential version, so the one that's essentially HP 1.1, needs 80% of the bytes to match up. So by multiplexing, we can start to deliver usable content to the visitor sooner, even if they don't have it all yet. Um, there are some questions over progressive images. So this study used progressive JPEGs. Um, because it's the only progressive image we've got at the moment. And there are some, some questions about how well people like it. But um, I think the real question we have to, or the real hypothesis we need to answer is, is a faster user experience better than some of the drawbacks that people feel they have with progressive images? Um, so if we adopt HP2, the question becomes, is when can we kill off some of our existing optimization techniques? When can we start adopting HTTP2? And the interesting thing is that browser support right now is pretty good. Um, Chrome supports it. Firefox supports it. Edge supports it without server push, I think. Safari 9 supports it without server push. So the browsers are getting there. The browsers getting pretty good support. Several implementations are a bit further behind, um, but they've certainly come on a long way in the last six months. So we're seeing uh, beta support from people like Nginx, although Nginx doesn't yet support server push. Um, the current Windows Server technical preview supports HTTP2, and you can go and fire it up on Azure if you want to play with it. Um, CDNs like Akamai and Cloudflare are looking at how they roll it out in a beta format to their customers. Um, and even Apache now has a HP2 server module. So we're, we're beginning to get to the point in time where we can realistically think about deploying this. Um, but choose your server carefully. And I'll show you some examples of why you need to choose your server carefully in a moment. So. Does it re respect the streams properly? Does it support the connection flow? Does it support the proper dependency mechanism? Um, a few years back when I was doing similar research on Speedy, um, I did this talk using exactly the same template that I used to do the H2 stuff. Um, and did this talk where this site was 30% faster using Speedy than it was using HTTP 1.1. A few months later, I went to do the same talk in New York. And all of a sudden, Speedy was about 25% slower. Um, and what had happened is Chrome had gone from a situation where it decided on the priorities and ensured they were fulfilled by the server to the point where Chrome hinted the priorities to the server and expected the server to fulfill them in order. And mod speedy on Apache just didn't pay any attention to those priorities. It just thought, oh, you, oh, you, you want these resources? I'm going to pick them up off disk in any old order, and I'm going to send them to the client. So I had things like images arriving for my CSS. My critical jQuery that was in the head was somewhere part down the page. So if the server doesn't support these dependencies and weights properly, then you're not going to get an optimal experience. And implementations are still young. Um, 
this is um, H2O. This is a waterfall generated from H2O 1.5, I believe. And if you look, you can see the request for the root page. But then if you look at the request for the three CSS files and the three JavaScript files, and you can read web page test waterfalls, you might notice something odd. So green is the time between making the request and getting a response, and blue is the time it took to download the response. And to give you a clue, what happens is even these though these resources are being pushed in the order two to seven, what happened is H2O is actually pushing the font first, then the sixth, CS, the sixth JavaScript file, then the fifth JavaScript file, then the fourth JavaScript file, then the third CSS, the second CSS, and the first CSS. It was pushing them in exactly the wrong order that I wanted the browser to download them. Um, this is fixed in the latest uh, H2O, which is 1.53. But I'm seeing similar behavior in some other um, servers. Um, sometimes browsers do things you don't expect. So I was experimenting with server push and pushing CSS and JavaScript and fonts. I thought, great, the top ones where the resources are pushed, by the way. So look, 300 milliseconds improvement. Uh, then I tested it in Firefox, and there was no difference between the two Firefox runs. Um, and I was talking to Pat Meenan of Google about it. And if we look at the waterfalls, um, we begin to see the top ones push, so we can see we get the HTML, and then we get the other resources really quickly afterwards. Whereas on the bottom one, there's a 300 millisecond gap in the waterfall where Chrome has just decided, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to wait. Probably, eventually, the preloader will start, and it begins to download. So when you implement things like server push, check them in multiple clients. Check that the behavior is what you expect, and there's not some unexpected um, browser behavior or server behavior influencing your tests. And one of the things is, if you're going to test with this, you need some tools. Um, so one of the first tools I tend to use, because it's the easiest, is web page test. And one of the things you can see in web page tests, and this is a Firefox test, I'm not quite sure whether it does it for Chrome yet, is if you're playing with server push, the fastest way to check it's actually working is use run a test in web page test, and you can actually see that web page test tells you it was loaded by HTTP2 server push. Um, but sometimes we want to dig into a bit more details than that. And this is where I find Chrome's net internals, um, part of the dev tools, quite handy. And what net internals does is you can go in there and it'll capture all network activity going on in the browser. So whether it's HTTP 1.1, whether it's HTTP 2, whether it's uh, making TCP connections, whether it's doing DNS lookups. Um, and you can either capture it locally in your own browser. You can run a test on web page test and generate the net log and download it. And that's what I did here. So I know we can start to do things like filter it. So we only see the HTTP2 um, se sessions. So we've gotten that one here, and I've picked it. And then we can begin to see that you know, in HTTP2 terms, we can see that this is where the browser sent the request for the page. And we can dig in more, and here we can see this is where the server, having got the request for the page, it's sent a push promise. So it's told the client that it wants to push this resource to it. Um, we can see some bits where, when you see HTTP2 stream adopted, it's where Chrome matches up that push promise to a resource it wants, so it's going to use it. So by digging into um, Chrome's net internals, <coughs> Excuse me, and there's far more than I've shown there because you can see where we're getting updates to receive windows. You can see bits, you'll see where you're getting headers, you'll see where you're getting data. You begin to understand how the server is actually sending those resources to you, whether it's prioritizing them correctly. By digging into it, you can get an understanding of, of what's actually happening and whether you're getting the behavior you want. Um, there's tools like NGHP2, which has a proxy that I sometimes play with in front of Nginx. Um, but it also has a client, so you can 
use it to request a page and see the same th sort of things you can see in Chrome's net internals. So you can begin to dig in to where the behavior is, how you expect it. And as these, as our servers and browsers mature, as they work more with each other, we'll begin to see some of these issues and some of these bugs um, squashed out of these implementations. We'll get to a more stable view. Um, there's something called H2 spec, which is another tool um, by somebody in Japan whose name I can't remember um, that allows you just to start testing your server. Um, this, I think, oh, I can't remember what server this is, but this was my server. Uh, sorry, Tobias, this is Akamai. <laughs> um, but, you know, these are all beta things. We're all learning and discovering and going through interoperability problems. Um, and if you love telnetting into your HTTP 1.1 server to check it's still alive, um, you can use, um, I forgot what it's called, H2I, um, to query your server as if you were a client. Um, so that's a stack of tools you can use if you want to get as nerdy as me and start digging into it a bit deeper. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that HTTP 2 relies, or oh, sorry, HTTP 2 doesn't rely on TLS. You can implement HTTP 2 without TLS, but no browser today implements it without it. So being efficient at TLS is really important because, you know, until we've done the DNS lookup, made our TCP connection, which is where our CDN comes in to make our TCP connection time smaller, and done our TLS negotiation, we can't make, we don't get content from the server. And if you want to learn more about TLS, um, Ilya Gregoric's page is TLS Fast Yet, contains lots of good information. But Ivan's book is probably the Bible. Um, if you work on the web and you do anything with HTTPS or TLS, I would really encourage you to buy it. Um, and the other thing is, as technology changes, as things like Heartbleed, et cetera, came out, Ivan actually updates the ebook version so it gets continually updated. Um, and then there's Ivan's project of SSL Labs, which is um, a testing mechanism, a grading mechanism for how well a site has implemented TLS um, or how well they've implemented HTTPS. So it'll issue big red warnings. It'll grade you from A to F, I think it is. But if you're still using SSL, whether it's version 2 or 3, you're not going to get a very good grade. But it's a good way of sanity checking your TLS implementations. Um, so we've talked a bit about servers. We've talked a bit about browsers. But as with any new technology, we have this bit in the middle. We have some people who are always going to be on yesterday's technology. So we have to serve HTTP 1.1 to. And the people who use modern browsers, who um, can use HTTP 2, have HTTP 2 enabled devices. And we want to try and deliver as good experience to both of them as we can. We might want to prioritize our HTTP 2 um, visitors because perhaps they're the future. Or perhaps we're a different kind of store. Perhaps we're a store that sells more to people who um, are pensioners, who've retired, who you know, tend to use older computers or older browsers. So our audience, our visitor audience, what they use will influence how we optimize. But there are some ways we need to balance out what we do. And fortunately, many of our good practices will remain the same. So things like making our content smaller to download so it uses less round trips. So gzip compression of things like JSON, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, minification to shrink it further. Good image optimization, so our images in an appropriate size, will remain a good practice. Um, reducing redirects, because redirects are essentially just a waste. They're not quite a waste of time. They're a necessary evil. But all we're doing when we do a redirect is saying, Mr. Server, I'd like this resource. Server responds saying, no, you don't want that. You want this. And you know, so we will always have redirects, because our content will move. Our sites will move. But we never want more than one. Um, Doug Sillers from AT&T and I did a talk a few years back at Velocity in the States where we looked at the HTTP archive. 
And I think the worst redirect chain we found was six redirects to get to the um, actual response that the browser really needed. Effective caching will remain a good um, practice because if we can keep stuff in our visitor's browser cache or in a proxy server cache, then you know we don't have to make a request for it. We save on the round trips. We save on using that bandwidth. We allow other things to be prioritized. Um, reducing latency, so moving our content closer to our server, and reducing DNS and making less TS TCP connections will remain good practices. Others are a bit less clear. Others we may have to vary a bit, um, depending. So we should replace inlining content with server push and have servers that can intelligently push, have servers that can query our pages, understand our pages, understand the relationships between the resources so we can start to push the appropriate content out to, to the visitor. Um, we should start to think about reduce, reducing the amount of CSS and JavaScript concatenation we're doing. So they're in smaller files that are more easily cacheable so that when one, one part of it changes, we don't invalidate it all. Um, and we probably want to reduce image spriting, although there are some interesting problems with image spriting. So I was talking to um, Rick Viscomi of YouTube, who wrote the web page test book with me, and they were experimenting with how to change image spriting. And one of the things they found is they were using images for rollover behavior. So you hover over something with a mouse, and the image changes. Now, the problem they were seeing in their experiments is they got rid of their sprites, they had separate images. Um, so you download the image for the normal state, but when you go to the hover state, you don't have that image, you don't have a sprite anymore, that's a separate image that then has to be, the browser has to go to the network and bring it back. So there are some questions about do sprites remain relevant for hover images or smaller sprites remain relevant. I'd actually encourage you to use SVG so you can style it with CSS and do the rollover that way, but there are, there are questions about it. And um, generally, we want to avoid sharding um, and splitting our content across all those hosts so that we um, allow TCP to main control, remain, keep control of its congestion control mechanisms. Um, but HTTP2 does help us in one way, in that um, if we shard across two domains, which is all we recommend for HTTP 1.1 these days, so we split our content across two domains, and if those two domains refer back to the same IP address, they're protected by the same certificate, then what HTTP 2 will do is coalesce those connections. It will merge them together and only use a single connection. Um, it's great in theory. It's a bit harder in practice because if you're using a CDN, you don't know that those two connections are going to be routed to the same edge node. Um, and with things like um, global load balancing, you can't. They may not end up at the same IP address. So there are, there are some challenges around that. Um, and this sort of brings me to how do we move on? We've we've got to this situation where. We know the optimizations we need to make for one protocol or for another, but we have a really diverse user bases often. We have people using old browsers, new browsers, fast connections, slow connections. And can we as developers or people who run our own servers, can we actually think of and put in place all the optimizations we need um, to deliver a great experience for people? Or are we going to have to rely on optimization services, such as ones based on mod page speed or Akamai's Ion, to deliver these things for us? Will the amount of variety that we need to cope with just be too much for us? Or does HTTP2 actually make things simpler? And I don't know the answer to that question now. I think it's a question a lot of people are going to spend a lot of time thinking about it. Um, and there are plenty of people with automated solutions out there trying to solve this problem. Um, in my experience, some um, are more effective 
than others. And I think for some of them, I could do a better job by hand. But that's a different talk. Um, but we've still got, even though HP2 allows us to make good use of the network, we've still got some challenges. We've still got things like people still use CSS at import, which means we don't discover we need some more CSS until we've got the first log. There's a question about how they're going to fit into ES6 modules. There's questions about how is service worker going to cope with HP2 push that will all be worked through, and we will eventually get some sane answers on it. But the challenge that we don't seem to get through is our use of third parties. And if you look on any large commercial site today, we make massive amounts of use of third parties, whether it's for A-B testing, whether it's for analytics, whether it's for image delivery. And HP2 doesn't really help us with this problem. Um, in the case of the FT, it does help them because all their images are on an image domain. Um, but where we've got lots of little requests, and this one has got 160 requests, only 47 come from the origin, the rest come from various third party services. HP2 doesn't help us with this much, but something called W3C resource hints should help. And what they do is they begin to give us ways and complementary ways of hinting to the browser what we're going to do. So if we're going to go to a third party, we can say resolve its DNS ahead of time. Or in Canary, I don't think it's in proper Chrome yet, we can say I'm sure I'm going to use this third party, make the TCP connection before I need it. And then what's coming along as well is preload, so we can say to the browser, look, I am going to use this resource from this third party, download it, here's an instruction. So there are ways of solving these third party problems, but the amount of third parties we use on the web will perhaps limit some of the gains we can get from HTTP2. If you want to learn more, um, Ilya's excerpt from High Performance Browser Networking is available for free. And Daniel Stenberg, who is Swedish and wrote Curl, um, has got a good explainer on the web. Finally, the thing I would encourage you to do is go and explore, go and play, go and learn, and share what you learn. Share your questions, share your puzzles. Because it took us from 1999 or even 1997 to 2007 before Steve Souders wrote his book about how to make the best of HTTP 1.1. And surely we don't want to wait, wait eight or 10 years before we can make the most of HTTP 2. Thank you. OK, do we have any questions? Andy, um, I was wondering about domain sharding. Um, would you say that domain sharding is evil per se, or would it make sense in the time we're still dealing with HTTP 1.1 to go for domain sharding of like two to three domains to have some domain sharding still available to uh, the older clients and only uh, and take a little imp uh, little um, impact on the performance for HTTP 2? So to, to basically serve both clientels with one, with one uh, domain or with one setup, or would you, would you encourage us to actually cre uh, create edit complexity and serve completely domain sharded things to HTTP1 clients and completely unsharded things to HTTP2? Okay, so if I summarize your question, um, I'd read it as, how fast should we shard on HTTP 1.1? And when we get to HP2, should we shard or should we deliver a completely separate experience that doesn't involve sharding? Is that a fair summarization? Yeah, basically what I'm wondering is complexity, yes or no. Mm -hmm. So edit complexity, yes or no for domain sharding. So at the moment, we don't recommend people shard to more than two domains on HP 1.1 um, to overcome the buffer bloat, the congestion issues. Um, now. What the and I think we can live with that with HP2 at the moment. Um, I think as HP 1.1 clients get less, we want to move to a world where we are 
um, not sharded at all. But as the FT's experience shows, because their largest assets, the images, are coming from Akamai, so being served over HTTP2, even in that world where they're serving the base page from one CDN, which is using HTTP 1.1, and the images from a separate CDN, which is using HTTP2, they are seeing performance improvements. So I think it partly depends on what content you're serving from it. If you're going to serve a, a, um, a large amount of content from the HTTP2 domain, I think you're OK. Thanks. I have uh, two questions. One is if there's more benefits to gain from a, for from HTTP2 for mobile clients, and I was also wondering uh, if there's any difference in support between mobile clients and desktop clients and laptops, even if the browser version is the same, so to speak. Okay, so I'll take the browser support question first, and I'll take the second one afterwards. So. Um, support is roughly equivalent for um, mobile and desktop versions of browsers. So uh, Safari on iOS 9 and Safari on OS X both support the multiplexed header compression aspects of H2. They don't support server push. Um, Chrome on Android and Chrome on the desktop both support the multiplexed aspects, the header compression and the um, server push. So um, the desktop and mobile browsers, their, their support on each platform is roughly equivalent. Um, the question about HTTP2 over mobile networks is one that has yet to be completely answered. There's a study out there that says Speedy was worse over mobile networks. Um, there are studies out there that show HTTP2 delivers its best benefits from, uh, I think it's about 50 to 250 milliseconds of latency. And beyond that, HTTP 1.1 is, is faster. So there are some questions about how appropriate it is for mobile. There's also some questions about having chosen the design for one to use one TCP connection what's the impact of packet loss on that connection? And we know that packet loss on mobile tends to be higher. So the, it, there are, it does need further study. There are competing camps arguing about it. And um, Google created something called Quick, which is the simplest way of explaining it is HTTP2 using UDP instead of TCP. Um, and what they do in that is they actually use two connections effectively. So we may see a world where HTTP2 goes to two connections to try and cope with that, that packet loss. But then we also have the question of, if I've got two connections, what's the likelihood of one suffering packet loss and another not when they're going over the same route, or are they both going to suffer the same problem? So there are still questions about its mobile deployment, I would say, or its, its deployment over cellular networks. Thank you. No one more? OK. Oh, oh, uh, yes, a question. Um, is there any, like, using the server push in some sort of messaging system, C keeping an HTTP connection alive, and then push stuff and something happens? So if so, the, the question, if I summarize it, is can HTTP2 keep the connection alive but idle? Um, and then, so you can do the effect of, of, of what we were doing long polling in HTTP 1.1. Uh, the server can determine how long it keeps the connection open for. I've forgotten what the default for when they get off, get closed is, but the, the server can choose to keep it open. No more questions? Okay, then we take 15 minutes break. And no more fire alarms. Yeah. No, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Andy.